So welcome. I'm here with um, poet to poet, writer to writer. I'm with Ellen Meister. Um, and uh, Ellen, Ellen wrote uh, a number of books and uh, she channeled the, uh, Dorothy Parker, uh, the famous satirist, poet, writer, critic um, in a couple of her novels, uh, Dorothy Parker, Drunk Here, I Drank Here and Farewell Dorothy Parker. She has a new book of poetry, of, of a new novel coming out called The Rooftop Party. Um, and we'll uh, touch on that as well. Um, but she's had a number of novels out. I just listed a few of them, but she's rather prolific. Um, so um, I was gonna ask you first, you know, of course I'm interested in Dorothy Parker and um, sure. and so are you, right? <laughs> so- um, For a long time now, yeah. For a long time now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Dorothy Parker has been described as uh, caked with salty humor, rough with splinters of disillusion and tarred with bright black authenticity. Um, you have channeled Parker in several books. What draws her to you? Are you, are you similar right. to her? Yeah, and I'll, I'll add that Tallulah Bank had called her the mistress of the verbal hand grenade. Yeah, right. Um, she came to the, to the Algonquin table when she was like 17, right? Uh, she was in her early, she maybe 24. Oh, oh. Tallulah, yes, Tallulah yeah. was like 17. Darth Parker yeah. was maybe in her 20s, yeah. yeah. That's correct. Yes, Tulu was just just a child. Right. Um, yeah. So I would say that I was a uh, Dorothy Parker fan from my teenage years when I started reading her poetry and just was astonished that somebody um, uh, from so many generations ago understood the type of heartbreak that I, as a teenager, was experiencing. At that age, you know, you're still at that tender age where you think your emotions are unique. And so here was this, you know, wonderful, sharp-witted, satirical poet who just got heartbreak. And that's what made me fall in love with her at first as a, as a young teen. And then I started reading about the Algonquin Roundtable and about uh, Parker in particular. Um, and I just got more and more interested in her to the point where Dorothy Parker sort of became that um, caustic voice on my shoulder that would say the things that I wouldn't dare say about any given situation. But I wanted to say? But wanted, but to, wanted say. to say, yes, yeah, I was yeah. too good a girl to do it, right? I wasn't Dorothy Parker, I was watching my tongue. So, um, so I carried her around with me and really always, I mean, my teenage years, college, my adult years. So then fast forward, I'm, you know, I, I didn't start writing novels until I was in my 40s. I kind of got a late start. Yes, I've been very busy, Doug, as you could, as you can probably tell. And um, I was noticing at one point how many novels there were uh, that paid uh, homage to Jane Austen, right? I mean, there was, if you might recall, there was a whole slew of them at once at one point. Some of them were almost like fan fiction, you know, sort of, you, you know, finding TV their way series into her, and all that, yeah. Yeah, finding their way into her novels. And some of them yeah. actually reimagined Jane Austen as a character. And I, listen, I love Jane Austen. I'm still rereading mm -hmm. her and, and getting right. so much out of it. But when I noticed this, I, th I thought, isn't that curious? Like, why is... Jane Austen, the only one who's getting this treatment. Like, why aren't any of my other famous, uh, favorite female authors uh, being paid tribute to in current novels? And I thought like Dorothy Parker. I said, I would kill to read a novel that reimagined Dorothy Parker in a contemporary setting. And I thought somebody should do that. And as soon as I had that thought, I said, well, maybe that someone is me. I am a very big Dorothy Parker fan and God knows I've, I've read enough about her. So I imagined this story and I did not want to write historical fiction. I wanted to actually bring her forward. And I saw her, you know, sitting in a, in a modern woman's living room and dispensing advice and sort of being at the same time, like a mentor and a tormentor. And um, so uh, my first Dorothy Parker book was born Farewell Dorothy Parker. And I had her sort of mentoring a, a, a very timid woman movie critic. Oh, you had a what with the movie critic? I'm sorry. She was a very timid woman. I, I I invented a character who was in some ways very opposite of Dorothy Parker in that she couldn't find her voice, right? She was very timid. She had social anxiety and wanted to create a character 
uh, who could have an arc that Dorothy Parker would affect. So I had this woman who who's, was choked on her own voice and Dorothy Parker as a character, uh, almost like a ghost haunting her life was able to sort of draw her out and, and, and help her evolve as, as, a, as a person. So it reminds I, me of Woody, Woody Allen's uh, play it again, Sam, where Bogart was uh, brought in to give him a, a, a advice about his you know, romantic life. There you go, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was challenging and it was intimidating because I, I wanted to pay responsible tribute to Parker. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to do anything to uh, sort of insult her legacy. So I wanted to um, pay responsible tribute both to her voice and her wit, but also to her whole persona, because I know that people see her as this caustic wit and they don't realize what else she was which was a person with a, you know, big, generous, tender heart. And, but um, she, wouldn't, was, she wouldn't suffer fools gladly. And in that respect, she was a modern, more modern woman than let's say John, Jane Austen, right? Oh, uh, she was, yeah. Doug, she was so modern. I mean, it, it, it's truly astonishing. I'm telling you, you can read, open up a play review she wrote a hundred years ago and the voice sounds so fresh. It's just astonishing. You know, and when I read that now, I think, what must people have thought in the 1920s when she was made uh, the theater critic for Vanity Fair and they read these reviews? They, they never, I don't think they could have ever read anything like it. And, and mm. you know, that's why she became such a quick star in the New York uh, theater and literary scene. Yeah, well, and it was tough for women more very tough for women back then. Yes. Um, now, D Dorothy was part of, of the Algonquin table, which most of us know that was a, um, a place where these gathered at the Algonquin Hotel where, you know, Robert Benchley, Alexander Wolcott, all these New Yorker right. type writers, journalists, mm -hmm. even Harpo Marx. Uh, and they would sort of like cost exchange caustic wit. And um, they, I think they were around for about 10 years. That's correct. Um, but it's interesting that Dorothy uh, later on, and you know, when uh, when she was older, said the those among uh, you know those at the uh, round table were not uh, the giants. Think about who was writing then. You know, Fitzgerald Hemingway. Those were giants. The round table was just a bunch of, and I paraphrase, a superficial wisecrackers. I mean, how would you address that? Listen, she she was a she was a very cynical human being, and. No, I think that she was very self-deprecating about her own past. So she didn't want to really give it any weight, this thing she had done. She was, she was very dismissive. I mean, she was very dismissive of, of most things. And I, but I think on the other hand, she really did believe it. I think that she revered the great literary authors and she knew that most of the people at that round table, they weren't, and it's true. I mean, you know, Hemingway and Fitzgerald, they weren't part of that group. I mean, there were there were journalists and, and sports writers and playwrights and and wits. But these were things that she did, so she couldn't, you know, elevate that to anything uh, beyond beyond what it was. Um, so, you know, that that's how I think. Uh, you know, she came to eventually think about it. I mean, interestingly, do you, do you think she she's right? Is she is she recognized in the literary canon now up there with uh, top notch writers. Do you think? Not quite because, yeah. because I think she never wrote a novel. I think it's harder for short story writers to be taken seriously. Oh, Henry um, did all right though. <laughs> yeah, oh, Henry did all right. And she won the Oh Henry Award once. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, no, but it's, it, it, you know, I think that if, had she written a novel, perhaps, you know, she would be in more, you know, uh, curriculums that, uh, you know, in, 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 you know, in English classes. Um, but she's, you know, she's not, unfortunately, not very widely read. Um, and her poetry is, for the most part, you know, considered light verse. Uh, though some of her, some of her short stories, you know, she could go very, very deep into uh, social issues and emotional issues. And I think her stories were, some of them gorgeously written. And, and fearless in the, in the topics that she covered. So I do wish that, you know, she uh, got more attention, okay. but uh, that's the way it is. And, and I'll tell you, Doug, she desperately did want to write a novel, but she just, she couldn't, she couldn't make it happen for herself. 
the, the uh, um, you know, your, in your earlier life, I was interested because my father was a madman in the advertising business, uh -huh. Jay Walter Thompson and, okay. you know, three martini lunch and all that stuff. Right. And, um, and uh, he told me that a lot of, you know, uh, copywriters, um, which you were, uh, yes. uh, uh, you know, harbored other writing ambitions. And, and I know Allen Ginsberg, for instance, was in the uh, advertising business. He went on to be this poet, the great beat poet. And uh, that's just one, but many have been, have been there. I mean, how was that as a sort of training ground for you as a novelist? Uh, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. First of all, I do want to say I, I probably, if not for being a copywriter, maybe I would have gotten my novel writing career off the ground sooner, but I was able to tell myself I was a writer, even though I was writing advertising copies. So I was able to sort of, mm. uh, you know, keep procrastinating. Well, when you say but just I advertising copy, I mean, advertising copy can be very, very creative stuff. I mean, it's it like poetry. Be, it could be yeah. like poetry. You have, to get, you have to get it in there in a few words, you know? Yes, and it was a good training ground. I mean, one of my bosses taught me, he, he took one of my brochures and he held it over the trash can. And he said to me, this is how people read what you wrote. He said, your job is to catch their attention before they let the paper go into the garbage. So I think my training was to try to capture people's attention very quickly and to make my point very quickly. And I do think it was great training for me um, to... To, to, to take my readers seriously and to value their time and, and to value what, excuse me, what it took to keep them interested in what I wrote. So yeah, I do think it was, it was very valuable for me. Good. Um, and tell us about, uh, you have a new novel coming out, uh, Rooftop uh, Party, right? Yes. So you tell, yeah. what, that's due out next month or? Uh, it's due out this coming Tuesday. So oh, yes, almost Tuesday the, yeah. the 25th. So yeah, yeah, it's almost here. Um, so, you know, it's interesting because most of my novels sort of fall, you know, somewhere in that literary fiction, women's fiction uh, kind of nexus. And I had never written a murder mystery. I, I read murder mysteries, but I've never had any uh, inclination to, to write one. And I, it's sort of a very specific skill and I didn't know how to do it. And one day I got this idea for a character for this, um, I was, you know, I used to uh, sometimes still, sometimes would fall asleep with the, one of those shopping channels on the TV because it was just sort of like mindless white noise in the background that I could yeah. sort of, you know, turn off and fall asleep to. Right. But I was kind of obsessing on these pristine, perfect women who are these hosts who seem like, uh, you know, like they have perfect lives and they're perfect looking and they're, and I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to take someone who was a real screw up in her life? You know, maybe she drank too much. Maybe she smoked a little bit too much weed. Maybe she liked to sleep half the day away. Maybe she slept around a lot and put her in that role. And so what, you know, what would happen if that woman, you know, we all went to college with this girl, right? But now <laughs> I'm, I, I make, I wanted to make her a, a shopping channel host. And I just thought that was a, a really, really interesting juxtaposition. It just fascinated me. It's one of those like fleeting ideas that was just going through my head probably as I was falling asleep, but it wouldn't leave me alone. Now that's I mean, I mean, I think, I think the mistake, I mean, when I teach creative writing, I, I teach creative writing at Endicott College and, uh, you know, I teach a lot of undergraduates and you know, one of the first things they do, everyone is blonde and blue eyed, broad shouldered, uh, you know, everything's yeah. perfect. And they, and I said, look, there are people, you know, who are bald <laughs> you know, and people <laughs> with, they're flawed, right. they're not, you know, uh, and, and I think that's what, you know, you want to make a realistic character. We all have our flaws, right? I mean, oh, it's so much more interesting to read somebody who's yeah, flawed, yeah. right? I mean, they, they mess up, they screw up and you get frustrated and why can't you get your act together? And to me, that's what makes a novel interesting. It gives it life, it gives it conflict. So I, I had this idea for this character and I thought, all right, well, I don't know if I'll ever write this book. And then one day, and honestly, Doug, I'm not one of those people who's fortunate enough that you know, my muse visits me and, and yeah. an idea rains down fully. For, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen to me. I yeah. have work at my idea. Usually I get like a little germ and I have to, you know, just yeah. plot it. And, and you face you know, the, you face the blank page and yes, you, it's, and it's uh, sometimes you just start writing. It could be gibberish and then something right, comes. Right. Exactly. Right. But in this case, I kind of feel like my window was open 
And the muse flew in and said, there's a murder at the shopping channel. And that's the book you're going to write, right? This, this, you know, this, this woman is going to the very things that make her so great at being a shopping channel host, um, her sort of nuclear eye for detail. It's going to make her a great amateur sleuth, right? So is that Muse, Dorothy Parker, who comes in, you think? I do, well, I don't think Dorothy Parker would be telling me to write a murder mystery. I don't yeah. know what that Muse was, but I, yeah. I first I thought they had the wrong house. Mm. I said, I, you know, I don't write <laughs> mysteries. Um, mm -hmm. So I, but it was, it was a fun idea to me. And I said, let me see if I can do this. And I literally from the ground up had to teach myself how to write a murder mystery because it, you know, it's like, a, it's a very specific skill set and you have to know how to set it up and how to create um, the red herrings and, you know, and, 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 you know, how to, how to lead all the roads to the, to the big reveal at the end. I, the, I uh, was, the, it's formulaic, isn't it? Yeah. Formulaic. Well, it's formulaic kind of... in that, you know, there's certain points you have to hit. Like I said, you have to, you have to give um, enough clues. You have to make the ending plausible. It's very easy to write a surprise ending if you don't give the reader all the information. So you have to, it, you know, it's very tricky. You have to give them enough information, but you have to trick them a little bit with, with red herrings. So um, I, I actually wrote the whole book, which at my stage of my career, it's not that common. Authors often, I should say, often uh, sell a book based on a proposal rather than having to write the full book first, right? After you've published several books, you can show your agent an idea, you write an outline, a couple chapters, they could sell it. I decided this was something new for me. I had to sort of prove myself. So I wrote the book all the way through. I was actually thinking about using a pseudonym on this book. I was eventually talked out of it, but I thought it's kind of off brand for me. Maybe I should, you know, go out as a debut. So I wrote the book and that was actually the one, um, it was Love Sold Separately, which came before this one. It was being called Kitty Kitty Bang Bang at that point. Um, and the, the publisher didn't wind up marketing as a mystery, but whatever. So I wrote that book and I had a lot of fun with it. And my publisher wanted another one. So I wrote uh, The Rooftop Party, which, um, you know, is the second in a series, but it also works as a standalone. So people, you know, just want to pick this one up. They can do that. And then this one, um, I had this real cathartic moment where I, I sort of based a character on some of the most nefarious characters in the, uh, or real life people in the Me Too movement. I had a man that was sort of an amalgam of, you know, Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby. And Very smarmy if I read the uh, press any, Yes, any number of smarmy people. And I pushed him off a roof, which was dense, which felt so Did you have great. any experience with that in your life? Smarmy? Uh, of course, right? Yeah, of course. Sure, sure. You know, I'm yeah. a, you know, I think any woman has, 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 has yeah. dealt with that in, in her life. Um, mm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it, it does, it is a very cathartic feeling to be able to be a novelist and have the power to exact revenge on one of those guys. So, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And, and then That's she has to, she was uh, the, this, the character, the shopping channel host was close enough uh, to be a suspect in it. So uh, she she winds up being very involved in the the rooftop murder right. and solving it. Wonderful. So yeah. perhaps you uh, um, perhaps you want to read a passage from your new novel. I don't know if that's sure. something you want to do. Yeah. Sure. Did you have any particular? Should I just read the? Well, I didn't characters? get the book. I just read the press re press releases. Okay. I didn't, I wasn't able to get the book. But um. Oh, you didn't receive the book. No. Oh, the I didn't come. I bet it'll come in tomorrow's mail. Isn't that annoying? There you go. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll try to get one of our reviewers to review it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, all right, I'll just stop reading. I could, I could start. Stop yeah, reading. yeah, short um, passage. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll read, read the opening. Dana Barry raised her fist to knock on the door and paused. She wasn't easily intimidated, but walking into Eleanor Gratz's office was like trying to open an umbrella in a hurricane and she needed a moment to anchor herself. Not that Dana wasn't used to stormy weather. Until she got this job at the shopping channel, her life had been one shitstorm after another. The last monsoon hit six months ago when she was fired from her job at a mall store in Queens. With no acting auditions on the horizon, Dana didn't know how she would pay her rent 
let alone her student debt. So she did the only thing she could think of. She got drunk and high. Thank God for her friend, Megan, who burst in and dragged her to an open call. Now here she was with a steady gig as a shopping channel host, and she was crushing it. Dana took a breath and rapped twice on the door. If that's not Anthony Bourdain with an exotic drink and two tickets to Fiji, get lost, Eleanor called. Dana opened the door and stuck her head in. You know he's dead, right? Like this whole place might be if I don't get my work done. So I'll stop there. Um, so so it, it's, kind of, it's, kind, it's, kind, it's kind of snarky, you know, and, and, and yeah. in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and um, But I was going to ask you, you know, the, uh, I mean, it, you know, most writers, you know, they have to, you know, they just some, suddenly have instant fame or things like that or instant success. I mean, you, it must have been hard at first to make your daily nut. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, what, what advice would you have? Maybe it didn't. Maybe you're just an overnight sensation. I don't know. But uh. Oh, you mean just in terms of trying to make a living as an author? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, you know, it's, it's a struggle. It was a struggle back then. It's a struggle now. Oh, okay. You know, I mean, my best advice to writers who, look, I think the first thing someone does if they want to be a novelist is they have to decide whether they really, really want to be traditionally published because being traditionally published, it's, it's brutally hard. And I, I, I don't discourage anyone from doing it. I'm just saying, if it's your goal, you've got to be really committed to it because there's so much rejection along the way and it takes a long time and there's so much waiting. So if you're committed to it, I say, great, do it. If you're not committed to it, then, and, and you want to self-publish and, you know, that's a completely viable alternative for you. So it's, it's really about what sometimes self-published books are. are picked up, you know, right? Yeah. I mean, like I said, it just, it really depends on what a person's goals are. When I, when I started out, I only wanted to be traditionally published. Of course, um, back then, um, self-publishing was a bit more stigmatized than it is now. You know what I'm saying? It was oh, like sure, considered sure. vanity publishing and, you know, was just, you know, it was like giving up. So I, I wasn't yeah. interested, you know, now it's, it's a very, very different, you know, print on demand field. and all that. Yeah. 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 I, it's a very different playing field. That's why I said to be whatever feels right for you. But if you want to go the, the traditional route, you just have to know the kind of commitment it takes and sort of relentless dedication to just keep pounding away at it and trying and trying and trying and trying and trying and waiting and waiting. So I do still feel, even at this stage of my career, I do a lot of trying and a lot of waiting. So, okay. yeah. All right. Well, that's, it's tough. It's a tough game. Yeah. No, no one ever said it was easy. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much um, for coming on Poet to Poet, Writer to Writer. And I wish you uh, the best of success with your new novel. Thank you, Doug. I, I really had fun. I did too.